to praise all. I tremble to all of that. Sometimes a song can say more than hymns. In Jesus' name we press on. Amen? Amen. Well, before we start our message today, um, prepare for the harvest. Uh, as always, I'd like to ask that you invite, I'd like to invite you to pray with me as we finish with the message today. And so let's just ask the Holy Spirit to guide our time together this morning. Our Father, Lord, you give every good gift to us. We are not deserving of the gifts, but you give it to us anyhow because of your great love. And Lord, we're asking now for a gift. We're asking for your spirit to touch our hearts and our minds and to compel us to action, but also, Lord, to be more like our loving Savior. We want to be more like Jesus. So, Lord, I pray that you please allow your word to come alive in our ears as we hear it and in our hearts as we plan to live it. So send your spirit to be with us and to teach us, we pray in Jesus' name. If you have your Bibles, uh, please turn with me to the Gospel of John. John chapter 4, the words of our loving Savior, Jesus. John chapter 4. You guys know John chapter 4, the chapter is dealing with Jesus' encounter with a Samaritan woman. And this Samaritan woman had a lot of baggage in her life. She had a lot of skeletons in her closet. Yet, when she had this encounter with Jesus, her life was changed. It was changed so much so that 
she went to the town, leaving her water pot, water pot behind, and she proclaimed throughout the streets, come see a man who tells me everything that I've done. You know, it's interesting that it's not good for people to know about your background, especially if it's a bad one. It's not good for your skeletons to be revealed in public. But yet this woman was able to say that. Why? Because through that encounter with Christ, Christ still loved her. Christ still saw her as precious. And even though Christ saw into her heart and saw into her life that everything was so sinful and disgusting and detestable. Yet despite that, his reaction to her was different. He still accepted her and loved her and gave her hope. And because of this, hope stirred in her hearts and she was proclaiming throughout the streets and all the people gathered all the Samaritans in that town gathered and flocked to see this man whom this woman was talking of. And we look at John chapter 4, verse 35. Jesus, seeing this large crowd approaching him as the disciples brought him food, and Jesus says this, Say ye not that there are yet four months, and then come the harvest? Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. What does Jesus say? The harvest is what? White. What does it mean when the harvest is white? It means it is ready to be reaped, right? It's ready to be harvested. So is Jesus lying when he says that the harvest is white? Okay. I like how this young person said no. Is Jesus lying? It's not. He's not lying. Yet, why is it Jesus says that the laborers, the, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few? So why is it that if the harvest is plentiful, the harvest is ripe, the harvest is white, why do we not have enough laborers? to bring in that harvest. Now, I believe the reason why is because there's a great disappointment among churches today about the meager results of evangelism. The meager results with the efforts to win souls. Now, I know some of you guys are already zoning out, but hold on, okay? <laughs> Stay with me. This is an important topic. And Evangelism is something that many people fail to realize, and we see that there's a lot of skepticism about evangelism. You guys probably heard statements like this. I just put some up here. It says, um, we should be focusing on reaching the community, not beating them over the head with doctrine. Have you guys heard that? We should stop with the old methods of evangelism because they are outdated. We need new methods that are relevant to the 21st century. People are just not interested in Bible studies. Why baptize people into the church when they only are going to leave later anyway? Statements like this and much more due to disappointment with very poor evangelistic results. And you know, the, the reason why that I believe that churches are failing in evangelism is because they are failing to see the big picture of evangelism. You see, we see here, we expect results from evangelistic series, and how often does evangelistic series take place? Once a year, right? So we, we make that the pinnacle, that we make it all about that event, and people expect great things from that one event that the whole church pulls together to do, puts a lot of money into to doing, but then it fails, or it seems to fail, 
or it doesn't bring in the results that they hoped would bring. And we see that evangelism, friends, is that's because evangelism is not a once-a-year event. Evangelism is, is, is it's like if you're expecting that evangelistic series to, to reap in as many people, it's like the farmer. You're, you're, you're going into a field, and you're expecting the harvest to already be there without any work put into it. And so the, the big picture is, is missed here. And that's the reason why Jesus used many practical examples from agriculture, examples of cycle, the cycle of planting and harvesting to illustrate the process of making disciples. And just as the agricultural cycle includes five things, soil preparation, seed planting, cultivation, harvesting, and preservation, those five. The cycle of evangelism is involving those five phases. And unless you have these five phases in place, you do not have the big picture of evangelism. You know, um, and in fact, if you do not lack, if you lack these phases of evangelism, it will not bring about true success, no matter what you do, because you're missing all five. So the problem often lies in failing to realize that evangelism is an ongoing process which involves multiple steps, and every step requires careful planning and hard work. What does it involve? Careful planning and hard work. Are you guys afraid of hard work? Who said not at all? Praise the Lord. Hard work. If one step is missing, the overall results will suffer. So let's go over these five phases. What I want to do today, today is going to be more of going through these five cycles, of these five phases of the cycle of evangelism. And I want us, as we are gearing for Unlocked Revelation, to really keep this in mind and see what areas that we as a church need to strengthen. So are you guys ready? All right, let's take a look at the first one. What is the first phase? Okay, it's to prepare the soil, okay, preparing the soil. And so in the parable, let's take a a look at Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13, we see the parable of the sower. You guys know this parable, right? In the parable of the sower, Jesus was teaching a very illustrative but insightful parable about the soil and the seed. So look at uh, Matthew chapter 13, verses 18 and 19. Matthew 13, 18 and 19. If you're there, say amen. Okay, it says, Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. If anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not... Then cometh the wicked one, and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which received seed by the wayside. So, question. What does the seed represent? The seed represents what? The word of God. That is correct. The seed represents the word of God. And what does the soil represent? Okay. How do you know? Okay, it's, it's, it says, that which is sown in his heart, right, in verse 19. So very clearly, the soil represents the human heart, okay? So the seed represents the word of God, and the soil represents the heart. And so Jesus taught that in order for the soil to receive the seed, what must happen? Okay. What is the first thing you do? When a farmer tries to um, prepare his harvest, does he just sprinkle seed just anywhere, any ground? Okay. You have to prepare the soil, right? So there needs to be a preparation of the soil. So the soil is probably hardened or it's dry. So you need to till the soil. You need to up, 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 um, 
Yeah, you need, to, you need to turn the soil up. You need to till the soil so that the soil will be more able to receive the seed, right? Now, it's very interesting that in the same way, the human heart, the soil represents the human heart, the human heart must also be softened to receive the Word of God. So the, the, the human heart also needs to be softened to receive the Word of God. So the question then is, how do you soften a human heart? Okay. So how, let, let, let's look at Jesus. How did Jesus soften the hearts of people in order for them to receive the Word? Okay. Let's find out from the Bible. Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10. What did Jesus do to soften the hearts of men so that they would be prepared to receive the truth of God's word? Acts chapter 10, verse 38. Acts chapter 10, verse 38. What did Jesus do? How did he soften the hearts of men? Thereby allowing their hearts to receive the word of God. Acts chapter 10, verse 38, it tells us how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil for God was with him. So what did Jesus do? What was his ministry mostly about? Okay. It was doing good, healing all who are oppressed, right? And so we see that Jesus, what was he doing to prepare the hearts of these men? He was through loving ministry to others. Jesus was meeting their needs. He was showing that he cared. He was be mingling among men. And through doing this, their hearts were softened. To receive the truth. And so through, through that, we demonstrate, when we demonstrate genuine love and care by ministering to the needs of others in our community, making lasting friendships, build trust, bring down defenses, then the hearts are fertile and open to receiving the truth. The church I want to ask you a question. What would prevent us as a church from going to those neighbors next to this church and befriending them? Can we do that? Can we go to the house right next to us, right throughout this window, and all the houses next to it? Can we come by their house and bring, by, bring food to them that's left over from potluck and say, you know, we care about you, and we're from the church next door, but we just want to let you know that we really care about you, and if there's anything you need, please let us know. Have we done that? The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. What would keep us from doing that? What would keep us from going across the street there? and just meeting the needs of the community, asking what their needs are, and seeing how we as a church can meet those needs. You know, there, there, there shouldn't be any, anything holding us back from doing that. Because by doing that, we prepare the hearts to receive the seed of the Word of God. Now, we could even, even ask them, hey, can we mow your lawn? You know, can we mow your lawn today? Something as simple as that to show that we care can make a big impact. It can, make, it can go a long way with those people, could it not? Now, here's an example of preparation events, preparing the soil, okay? So, by the way, there, should, there is a calendar of how you should do these five phases of evangelism. They're all sequential, okay? So, as we're talking about Unlock Revelation... The preparation for the soil should be taking place from March, January to March. We're behind. <laughs> from January to March would be the time to start preparing the soil, start doing things in the community. We've done a few events in the community, but we could do more. Amen? And so let's take a look here, examples of soil preparation events, finance seminars, 
cooking classes, exercise classes, health seminars, supper clubs, care groups. It was very interesting. We um, at the other church had an event called Shadow Empire. How many of you guys have heard of Shadow Empire? Okay. We did it here at this church as well. And um, at the other church, we had people from the community come in. There was a gentleman named Larry that attended Shadow Empire. And then we got his interest. He signed a, a form where we got all the interest to sign the form. And we had his interest for a long time. And then finally, we said, we, you know, we got to do something. Let's, let's start a care group. And we started a care group in Chickaming. And um, we tried to invite Larry to come. And Larry says, no, 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 no I'm busy. No, I can't come. Now's not a good time. No. And, and so we thought that, you know, we were at the point of giving up. We thought maybe he's just giving us a run around. He's not interested. But then we kept asking. And we kept praying. And we prayed and asked and prayed and asked. And finally, he said, yes, I'll come to your care group. And he came to our care group, and it was really amazing because as he was coming to the care group, we're eating, we're, we're socializing, he started to feel comfortable around us. And then he even admitted, he said, you know what, I'm, I'm here because I want to learn. And that just gave me an alert. I said, if he wants to learn, then maybe he'd be open for Bible studies. So then I asked him, hey, Larry, would you be interested in learning more? Um, and maybe we could have a Bible study together. And he said, yeah, sure, I would. And so we scheduled a Bible study, and we went over Daniel 2. And he was blessed by that. He says, you know what? Let's meet again. <laughs> Let's meet again. And you know, it, was, it was interesting because it started off with a soil preparation event. Okay, so he came to the care group, and from the care group, now we brought him into a Bible study. He accepted that Bible study. He says he wants to learn more, right? And so his heart was prepared to receive the truth, and his heart is still receiving the truth. So, you know, after doing these acts of service, after helping people, should we be satisfied with that? Should we be saying, okay, they're coming to our care group? Great, now we are done with our work. We can expect a harvest. No. It's, it's, it's ludicrous, right? Because think about it. It's, it's like thinking, same thing with the example of the farmer. It's like the farmer tilling the soil all day. And he just tilled the soil. He's like, wow, okay, good. I till the soil, and the next day he tills the soil again. And the next day he tills the soil again. And the next day after that. Does that make sense that he just keeps tilling the soil? No. Right? So we cannot just stop there. The cycle of evangelism doesn't start there. Many people are just fine with just doing community events, and that's it. We did our part. God will reach them somehow. That's not true, friends. That's only one phase out of the five, right? And so just as you till the ground, which is the first step, and you do nothing else, you cannot expect to look forward to a harvest. So that leads us to our next phase. What's our next phase? Planting. Okay, so you plant it. Now you prepare the soil. The soil is now ready to receive the word. And so now we plant the seed. And the seed we understood to be what? The word of God, right? And so the word of God is now ready to be implanted into their hearts. And so we see in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Turn there with me. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. You guys need to find these verses fast because I've got to move quick. Because I see the clock is against me. So stay with me. Okay, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6. This is a principle that Paul brings out. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6. If you're there, say amen. Okay, thank you. It says, but this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also, what? Sparingly. And he which soweth bountifully shall reap also, Bountifully. This is a very simple principle, yes? It's like as much as you put into something, you can expect as much to come out of it, right? If you put very little in it, you can only expect what? Very little. So in other words, when you're actually wanting a big harvest, do you just plant one seed and that's it? No, you try to put as much seed out there so that you could have a bountiful harvest, right? That's what, you want, that's what you're aiming for, right? Or else why even plant at all, right? And so we see that in the same way, we need to, 
what? Sow bountifully. We need to sow bountifully. So examples of planting events. And by the way, planting events, when we do these planting events, it should take place from the months of April to May. Okay? So planting events could be like a glow-a-thon or uh, mass uh, handbill mailings to a, a community or door-to-door -door evangelism and literature distribution. We're going to be doing literature distribution today. And I hope that all of you guys can join and be laborers um, and pass out those seeds of truth to those around this area. And, and um, you know, glowathons, um, you know, you could simply just take an afternoon and blitz a street. You guys know what it means to blitz a street? Yeah? You just take glow and you just blitz it. You just put one in every door, right? And, the, and you just cover that whole area, right? You just blitz it. And so who's to say we can't do that, Right? We, we have so much glow tracks in this church. <laughs> you know, our church is like we could, a seed factory, but our church will, will those, that literature being in our church and remaining in our church will do us no good unless it goes out, until it goes out to where it's supposed to get into the hands of the people around us. We need to spread the seed. We need to um, sow bountifully in order to reap bountifully. And so we see that... Uh, Story of Hope books today we're going to be passing out, and John is getting that ready so that we can be out into the community passing those seeds of truth. You know, it's very interesting that um, many Christians, many Christians do well at building friendship with others, but they never get around to sharing the Word of God. You know, they think that just being friends is enough, but in actuality, when the time comes, to discuss spiritual matters of faith or to share truth-filled literature, we have this fear of jeopardizing that friendship by sharing them with them about the Word of God. We have this fear that they're going to run off. We have this fear that we're going to offend them. And friends, you know, a farmer must plant the seed if he expects a harvest. In the same way, a true Christian will not fail to plant the seeds of truth in the hearts of those that he cares about. So if you truly care about those friends, those non-Christian friends, the best way to actually reach them is to tell them through Bible studies, to reach them through Bible studies. Nothing shows more that you care than when you tell them about Jesus, when you share with them the seeds of truth. If you don't care, you don't share. And so after we, pl after we plant a seed, is that it? Are we done? Okay. Can we expect a harvest from that? No. You don't just give them a glow track and say, okay, God bless you, see ya. Right? Don't stop short there, but go further. And this, is this is leads us to our next phase. What's our next phase? It is dealing with cultivation. Okay. Now, cultivation is interesting. This stage is interesting because once the seed has taken root, the new plant must be cultivated. So this includes what? Watering, fertilizing, weeding, fending off pests and critters in order for the seedling to grow. And this phase is by far the most time-consuming and labor-intensive phase out of all of the phases. Think about it. How long does it take to till a soil? It just takes probably like one day, right? How long does it take to plant seeds? It's one day, right? But cultivation, it takes the whole time, not even weeks, probably even months, right? To, to cultivate that, that plant. You gotta weed it, you gotta you know, make sure that it's growing nice and strong, it's getting enough water, it's being fertilized, all these things. And you know, it's, it's you know, as it is in the physical, so it is with the spiritual. The primary way to nurture the growth of the seed in someone's heart is by giving regular Bible studies. Giving regular what? Bible studies. So it is through regular study and application of the Bible that helps us to spiritually grow. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2 says um, that he describes the word of God as the milk of the word which we grow thereby. Okay? And so we need to grow through the Word of God, and we need to be able to cultivate our interest 
through Bible study. So it is through patient effort that we guide someone through a series of Bible studies. How many of you here have ever given a Bible study? Okay. So it, does it take a long time? It does. You have to guide them truth after truth, right? And you have to guide them along. And sometimes they come to a particular truth, like the Sabbath, and they're very challenged by that truth because that means they have to forego their job working on Saturday. That means that they have to forego um, doing the things that they love to do on Saturday. they got to forego going to uh, sports events on Saturday. And so they're, they're just kind of like, oh, you know, I, I know the Bible's saying that, but it's, I can't go all the way with that. And so you have to labor with them, right? You've got to uproot the bad influences in their lives. You've got to fend off the things that could actually cause detriment to that plant that is being cultivated. And so you labor with them. You, you, you work alongside them. You, you, you guide them and continue to lead them through the word of God. And you're cultivating that interest. And so it takes time. It takes commitment. It takes faithful dedication and wrestling on, alongside with our interest so that they can be ready for the next stage of the evangelistic process. And what's the next stage? So you've prepared the soil. You planted the seed. You've now gone through the long process of cultivation. Now what is the next phase? The harvest. The harvest, right? So cultivation events is like Bible studies, Bible study teams, groups, and BibleStudyOffer.com. By the way, a lot of people are misquoting their website. They're saying BibleStudy.com. <laughs> it's BibleStudyOffer.com. So please make sure you say it correctly or else we lose that interest. Okay? So the next um, phase is harvest. Okay? Now harvest is to take place when? When is our harvest time? When is our target harvest date? September, that's right. September is our target harvest date. And so after all that work, after all that commitment, after the work of preparing the soil, the seed, cultivating the crop that has been faithfully done, we can look forward to the harvest. Amen? Okay, good. Glad you're excited. Only when the soul winner has carefully followed each phase of the evangelism cycle can he look forward to a harvest of souls as people take their stand for Christ in baptism. And friends, there's nothing more thrilling than that. When you see an interest that you've cultivated from the ground up, and they finally make that decision, and they go down into the waters of baptism, they come up in newness of life with joy on their face, and their lives are to be changed forever. There's nothing more thrilling than that. And you know, as we're talking about a harvest... Um, Harvest is dealing with evangelistic series and reaping series. So do you see how the evangelistic series alone cannot do it? Can you guys see that right now? Right? The evangelistic series alone cannot bring in the results alone. We have to do all the other phases before that. Now, at our house, we have a strawberry garden. And um, each year, we tend to that st strawberry garden. And we have to water it and have to weed it. And Chloe goes out with me because she loves strawberries. And um, she gets so excited when the strawberries turn bright red and ripe for the picking. And when it's time to harvest those fruits, we take out our little bucket and we start harvesting those strawberries. We put them in the strawberries. As, as the bucket gets fuller and fuller, Chloe gets more and more excited, right? Because she's... She, says, she sees the, the bug getting full of strawberries, and it brings her so much joy as that bucket is getting fuller and fuller. And friends, in the same way, if we are involved in the harvest event and we see more souls being baptized, would that not make us more joyful and thrilled about more people are making decisions for the kingdom? Amen. Amen. And, you know, I, I see a, a, a parallel to that. Just as my little daughter gets so excited about strawberries and harvesting strawberries, in the same way, we will be also interested and excited as people are making the decision for baptism, making the decision for Jesus, that will be a life-changing decision. We need to be excited about that, friends. 
Yes, there's a lot of work involved. Yes, there's a lot of labor involved, but at the end, it is all worth it. At the end, we will have the joy and we'll be saying, praise the Lord, it was hard getting to this point, but finally, we want some souls to the kingdom. We want many souls to the kingdom. And that should be our aim. That should be our attitude. That should be our faith being tested, knowing that the Lord will bring those souls into our church. And so I find, I, I, I don't know about you guys, but I find evangelism exciting. <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm, I'm preaching this, and you guys are just like, and I'm just getting excited. I'm like, all right, you can sleep, but I'm going to just get excited about this, even if it's just by myself. You know, this is an exciting thing to be a part of, friends. This is like so exciting. You, if, if you lost that excitement, you, you really need to, I don't know, get, get, get a jump start or something or, or a boost or something, but a spiritual boost of some kind. But this is what we're all about. This is what we as a church were meant to do, right? And, and if you are not excited about this, which you should be, because what are you doing? You're actually bringing more souls into the kingdom of God. You're bringing souls from death to life, from darkness to light, from error to truth that will set them free in Jesus Christ. Friends, this is the greatest work that God can ask, ask any of us to be a part of. It's not just a work of the minister, but it's the work of the collective body. I cannot do this work alone. That's why we are a part of a body, right? A body needs each other. A body works together. A body thrives together. A body grows together. And this is the means by which we grow spiritually. You know, it's very interesting that Jesus said in Matthew chapter 9, verse 38, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Jesus saw that it would take more than tillers. It would take more than just sowers. It would take more than just cultivators to get the job done. Jesus saw that he needed workers who knew how to harvest. He needs workers that are familiar with all five phases of evangelism. It's not just a one shot and I'm done type of deal. It's an ongoing process because you are excited. You are invested in this process because you care about those souls. Because you care about those people. You care about their salvation. And that tells you whether you truly have the love of Christ driving you in this work. Because if you don't have the love of Christ driving you in this work, you're just going to see this as a drudgery. You're going to see this as something that I have to do because the pastor told me to. Now, Jesus is telling us to do it, not me. Jesus is telling us, pray for more workers. We need more workers. The harvest is white, ready to be harvested. What are we waiting for? Go out there and bring them in. Only one amen. I'll take it. I'll take it. Evangelism page 283. Listen to this. Um, actually, I have the quote. You can listen and read along. Many are convicted of sin and feel their need of a sin-pardoning Savior. Many are in need of a sin-pardoning Savior. Amen? But they are merely dissatisfied with their pursuits and aims. And if there is not a decided application of the truth to their hearts, if words are not spoken at the right moment, calling for decision... From the weight of evidence already presented, the convicted ones pass on without identifying themselves with Christ. The people should be urged to decide just now to be on the Lord's side. So what is this quote telling us? The quote is telling us that what we need to do is we need to lead every soul that we are working with to make a decision. To make a decision. Now, I know that some of your hands went up for those who said that they give Bible studies. Praise the Lord, you're giving Bible studies. But do you simply just disseminate information to them and close the Bible and say, okay, we're done. We'll see you next week. I hope not. You see, my friends, that study is just one part of it. 
the most important part at the end of every Bible study, you know what that is? You've got to ask them to make a decision on what they've learned. So when you're going through the Sabbath truth with them, you've got to ask them to make a decision based on what they've learned. Say, brother, based on what we learned today about the Sabbath, is it clear to you that the Bible tells us that the seventh day is the Sabbath? And we're not to work on that day as a day that God himself made holy and that we're supposed to keep it? Are you willing to make that decision today in your life right now? And when you, make, when you ask that question, right, you stop saying anything. You just keep quiet. Why? The Holy Spirit. That's the moment of time where the Holy Spirit will now speak to that person's heart because you prompted that question. You prompted them to now make a decision on what they've learned. And the Holy Spirit is going to speak to their hearts. And so you must just quietly pray and wait for a response as however awkward as it may seem. Why? Because you are working alongside with heavenly agencies to win souls to, king, to the kingdom, right? So we need to lead everyone to make a decision. That's what it's all about. It's not just about giving head knowledge. It's about leading them to make a decision about what they learned and how they're going to apply it to their lives, right? So it's very important. Now, we lead to our final phase. What is our final phase of the evangelism cycle? Preserve. preserve. That's right. We preserve. And so we see the fifth, the fifth uh, cycle is dealing with preservation. Um, so once these new converts are baptized, praise the Lord, we got them into the church. Is that it? We just let them go say, all right, thank you for joining our church. Join us for a potluck, and we'll see you next week. Is that it? What's missing? You know, statistics show that a great number of people that are being baptized into the church and that join the church, a great number of them leave the church within a few years. So it's like you just lost those contacts that you worked so hard for. So what, what do you need to do after they get baptized? You need to preserve those people that you just got baptized, right? And we see the great commission that Jesus gave found in Matthew chapter 28, verse 20. Let's turn there. Matthew 28. Verse 20. We are almost done, so hang in there. We're on the fifth one. So you know the end is near. Matthew chapter 28, verse, let's read verse 19. Matthew 28, verse 19. It says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Right? So we baptize them. Right? And verse 20, what do we do after that? Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And so we see that there's also teaching that takes place not only before baptism, but also after baptism, right? So we need to also continue to teach them and guide them and also train them to be um, disciples um, and also be involved in the work. So, so we see that the cycle of evangelism, if we go through all five cycles correctly as the Bible brings forth, you know what happens when you do all five cycles, I mean all five phases in the cycle correctly? It self-sustains itself. It self-sustains itself. So those new converts now start to do the work. And it compounds every time. And it keeps self-sustaining itself and it keeps exponentially growing if it's done correctly. Right? And so, you know, that's why I get so excited because the potential in this church is great. You know, if we start with a group of people and we have people like Jeff, and John Nichols, who came to this church recently, and they're so on fire, and it's so awesome to have them on fire because then they will ignite the rest of the church. <laughs> and, we, and we need that. We need that new blood. We need that, 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 that uh, spiritual boost. And those people work, and the cycle continues, and more people come in, and those new people also work, and then the new people come in, and it keeps going, and it keeps sustaining itself, friends. And that's, that's what it was intended to happen. The harvest is truly 
plentiful indeed, but the laborers are few. Could it be that the laborers are few because we are not actually doing all five phases? Are you a laborer for the harvest? That's my question today. Are you a laborer for the harvest? You know, William Carey, oh, by the way, discipleship example of preservation events, I don't want to skip this. New Believer Sabbath School, new member discipleship, the discipleship handbook. Those are key ways to actually teach those newly baptized members so that they can be grounded and ready and prepared to continue to serve as a leader in the church and to do the work alongside with the church body. Okay, so let's take a look. The harvest is truly plentiful, but the laborers are few. Are we laborers of the harvest? Uh, there's a man by the name of William Carey. Some of you guys probably know him. He's known as the founder of modern missions. And Carey was a minister, schoolmaster, and cobbler or shoemaker by trade when he left England to begin mission work in India. While in England, he used to go from village to village proclaiming the gospel to Jesus to the people. And one day, a friend of him saw him do this, and he thought, this guy's crazy. He's not getting his priorities straight. He should be focusing on his business, not getting distracted by trying to share the gospel with other people. And so he confronted his friend. He says, why are you talking to these people? If you only attended to making shoes more than you do talking to people, you would have much better business, and you would prosper far better than you are right now. And so to which William Carey responded, he said, neglecting my business, my real business is to preach the gospel and to win souls. I cobble shoes to pay expenses. So see, he had the right priority in mind. Just like Paul, when he was a tent maker, Paul was not doing the tent making business just to make money for himself, but he was doing it so that he could sustain himself in the work of the gospel. And William, William Carey is the same way. So how about you, friend? Is your business your utmost priority? Is your job, is your career, is your lucrative company, or is your business to accomplish the task that God has given you to, to, to preach the gospel and to win lost souls? You know, there's many that may give justifiable reasons why they don't get involved in this work. You see, there's a, there's a prevailing apathy among the church today in regards to this sort of work. There's a spirit of resistance, and that tells us very clearly that the devil is at work. Because the devil knows the potential of the cycle of evangelism, and he just wants to disrupt that cycle and cause people to be discouraged and not even try again. But you know, friends, I want to now get personal as we close. You know, I understand that there are some here who have zero desire to be involved in any way, shape, or form due to reasons that may seem justifiable. There are some here that are probably in a state of mourning over a loss of a loved one or a loved one is causing them grief. There are some here that unknowingly have a am I my brother's keeper type attitude where they think, I don't live in Buchanan, I live in Berrien Springs, or I live in South Bend, or whatever. So this is not my jurisdiction, it's not my business. I'll let them take care of it. There are some here that are so busy with life, they just check into church and check out and nothing more. There are some here that are probably don't want to be involved with anything that the pastor is saying. Because it's just a pastor's work. Although these may be justifiable reasons, one thing is very clear. That one thing is that we all want to go to heaven. But friends, I want to tell you this. Although we all want to go to heaven, you cannot go to heaven alone. You cannot go to heaven alone expecting that you'll go alone without bringing someone with you. If all you care about is your own personal salvation, you've already missed the boat. 
We need to be in the business of bringing others with us. Bringing others into the pearly gates. Let me tell you this, you cannot expect to go to heaven alone. In order for you to make it to heaven, to be reunited with your lost loved ones, in order for you to live in eternal bliss and be freed from this chaotic world, in order for you to experience the joys of heaven now before we get there, in order for you to make it to heaven so that you can live with your pastor or whoever you have a beef with and be happy with them throughout eternity, you must bring others into the pearly gates with you. You cannot expect to go to heaven alone. God will ask you, when you come, when he comes to give to every man according to his work shall be, when he comes, he's going to ask you, did you bring any souls with you? Did you bring in a harvest of souls that you labored for? Did you bring souls that you invested in? And what will you say? Will you say, I think so? Or will you say, I was afraid to? Or will you say, I was too busy? Or will you say, I didn't want to do it because my pastor, I don't like it. Will those be justifiable reasons to get you into heaven alone? Friends, Matthew 24, 14 tells us, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached unto all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then what? And then shall the end come. You know, the majority of the suffering that is taking place in the world today is largely our fault. Think about that. The majority of the suffering that's taking place in the world today, you know, we have the audacity to blame God. Why does God allow these bad things to happen? But the, act, the finger should be pointed at us. Because Matthew 24, 14 tells us very clearly that the gospel once is preached into the, all the world for a witness, then the end shall come. So the ball is in our courts, my friends. Are we doing our part to allow the gospel to go into all the world with a fervent desire to end this chaotic world that we're living in and to end the suffering once and for all so that Jesus will come and sin will be no more? There's a work that needs to be done. There's a work that God is calling you to do. And that work has been largely forgotten because Satan, the enemy, has done a great job to distract us, to keep us busy, and to also help us to not see the value of this work. And we're so self-focused on ourselves. We're so self-focused on how things are going wrong in my life. People are, in my family is, is making me upset and, and what a failure my life is and how could this happen? How could they do this to me? And we're focused on ourselves and at the same time, we want to go to heaven. But we don't have, our love, we don't have love for our fellow brothers or sisters or those who cause us grief. Friends, it's time to take the focus away from self. It's time for us to do this work as our master did. So what do you say? Is this a work that you yourself want to be a part of? How, do, how many of you here today would like to say, Lord, it's true. I haven't been doing my utmost to fulfill Matthew 24, 14. I haven't done my part. I haven't put my priorities straight to allow the end to come so that your coming will be hastened. But now I see the seriousness of the world we're living. It's getting worse by the day, is it? How much more are we going to tolerate until we wake up? And you want to say today, Lord, I want to be more proactive. 
I want to be involved in not just one cycle, but all five cycles of evangelism. And I want to be committed to it because I believe that this is the work. It's a privilege to be a part of this work that God calls us to be a part of. How many of you guys are willing to say that? I will take a more proactive role and be a part of this great work that God calls us all to be a part of. Praise the Lord. Let's have a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we are so grateful that we can look forward to the world to come, that we can look forward to being with you face to face throughout all eternity, that we can forego the things of this life that causes us pain, heartache, disappointment, discouragement, and trials. But Lord, until that day, Help us now to put forth with earnest effort the work that you've called us to be a part of. Help this church, O Lord, to be able to do its utmost in hastening your soon return and to lead others to know who you are as our loving Savior and Lord. Be with us, we pray, in this great work. Bless this church and all that are in it. Bless the leaders. Bless all who are involved, and I pray that more laborers will join in this great work. We thank you for your promises that you will do a great work in us as we cooperate with you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.